awkward clap. That was, I think about three of you started, the rest of you felt guilty. You got involved. I'm sorry. You're stuck with me again. No, I am, uh, I am Pastor Chris. I have the privilege of being on staff here, and uh, I have the privilege of sharing our message today. And uh, you guys are brave coming out in the snow to hear God's word. Give yourselves a hand. Oh, y'all clap for that. So, cool. Now, we are in the midst of Advent, which is a season before Christmas in the church where we take time to prepare our hearts and minds to, to celebrate Christ, to make sure that we really take in what is happening. And we've been in the midst of a series called His Name is Jesus. And this series I explained last week came from an idea that Kim Manson had where she was giving out a devotional to all of our kids for Advent. And each of the first 28 days in December, it talks about one of the names used for Jesus in Scripture. And she brought that to, to us and we said, you know what, let's, let's do that with the whole church. And so we started this kind of movement where we have a, a daily name and a daily reading. Uh, some of you have been getting those text messages. If you haven't, you can text the word Advent to that number. And I do apologize. There was a technical glitch in the, the service that we used to send out these messages this past week. And for a few days, they didn't show up. We've, we've been able to fix it, uh, and you should get those now. But I hope you've been following along. If you haven't, let me recap the past week. On Monday, we talked about how Jesus is the Savior. Then we talked about how Jesus is the Redeemer. One of my favorites, we talked about how Jesus is the prophet, how Jesus is the great high priest, how Jesus is the king, how Jesus is the good shepherd, and then today we're talking about how Jesus is the son of David. And the son of David, this is not one of the common names that we use for Jesus. Like, if somebody came up to you and asked you, you know, who is Jesus to you? It's not unheard of for you to think, oh, he's, he's my Lord. He's my Savior. He's Jesus. He's Christ. He's the Messiah. But most of you, you probably don't go directly to, oh, he's, he's the son of David. In fact, some of you might have read that and you thought, no, he's not. He's, he's the son of God. Or maybe Joseph, depending on how you break that down. But not, not David. But this is a term that we see used over and over again in the Gospels. In Matthew, the book we're going to take a look at today, it's used 10 different times. And, and it's often used at, at pivotal moments in his ministry right before great miracles or great teachings. In fact, we read here in Matthew 21 that as Jesus was entering into Jerusalem for the Passion Week, this is the height of his popularity. Everybody's gathered along the sides of the road to welcome him in. And it says Jesus was in the center of the procession and the people all around him were shouting, praise God, for the son of David, blessing on the one who comes in the name of the Lord, praise God in the highest heaven. So it's kind of interesting because it's used at these pivotal moments, but it's often used by common average people. It wasn't the religious leaders calling him this. It was the peasants, me, you, not that you're a peasant, but, but as normal people, this was a name that they would use to talk about Jesus, the son of David. And so that is what we're going to talk about today. And, and to do that, we're going to take a look at what I would like to call the most boring passage in the New Testament. Yes, yeah, some of you are excited. I, I was hoping for a little more excitement there because today we are indeed going to look at the most boring passage in the New Testament. Some of you are like, why did we get out in the snow for this? Why, of all things. But, but I'm hoping by the end, maybe it's not as boring as it was before. 
But before we get into what that actual passage is, I want to talk about the Gospels. Uh, there are four of them. Anyone know the names? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I was really hoping somebody would step up there, but Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospels we have, we have these different Gospels written to different audiences. They were writing with a unique audience in mind. They were writing with a unique purpose in mind. I say that because they are not, as you read them, they are not non-biased historical archives. They're not just a collection of the stories for the sake of collecting the stories. Each of those writers were writing for a certain reason, and they were writing to a particular audience. And I think that's important for us to know for, for a couple reasons. One, when we begin to understand that, we understand why they do the things they do. Why stories appear next to each other. Why one uses this phrase and another uses that phrase. How they're interconnected and, and where they split apart. Once we begin to grasp that they're, they're different gospels for different audiences, we can begin to understand that better. But here's where I think it gets even more personal is that each of these writers knew that they had a voice and they could use that voice to share the Jesus story to people who would listen to them. And I know that I could talk about Jesus until I lose my voice. I'm hoarse, I'm done, I can't do it anymore. But there are certain people in this world that are just not gonna hear it from me. They look at me and they say, you're annoying. I don't like you. You're not a part of my crowd. So what you say, it doesn't matter to me. But somebody else could share their Jesus story. And, and because that person is unique and has a unique story and a different audience, that story might mean more to that individual. Uh, an, another practical example of this, if, uh, if one of you went to Home Depot and you bought a power tool and you were walking out and for whatever reason, I was in the parking lot of that Home Depot and I, did somebody just laugh? <laughs> I've been there before, twice, and I walked up to you and I said, oh, is that the one that you bought? And you said, yeah. And I said, no, no, no. There was a different brand. It was about the same price. You should have gone with that one. That one would have been a better purchase. Most of you in this room would not care about what I had to say. Because you're thinking that's the same guy that in a sermon this last summer referred to a saw by the wrong name. And some of you still bring that up. And so you're going to say, this guy doesn't know power tools. I don't care. But some of you know somebody in your life that does know power tools. And if that individual met you in the parking lot and walked up to you and gave you the same advice that I did, but using the right words, the right terms, and the authority they have in your life, you would listen to them. You might even walk back in and exchange it for the other one. See, each of us has a unique voice and a unique story that we can share with a unique audience. Your story matters. And so guys, I encourage you to go out and tell your story, especially in this Christmas season as we're celebrating Christ. What better time to look for opportunities to tell people who Jesus is to you. Because you have a sermon to preach that I can't. You have a congregation in your life that needs to hear it that I don't. Your story matters. And the gospel writers knew that. Now, another thing you need to understand about the gospels is that everything is connected. Um, they are constantly quoting sometimes each other but oftentimes different texts and passages from the Old Testament. Now, in some of your Bibles, if it's a direct quote, you'll actually see a little footnote and it'll tell you what they're quoting. But they even do it more than we realize. 
Because a lot of times they're not quoting directly a passage, but they're referring kind of in hidden language to a story that everybody else would have known. Or they're, they're using the same phrase that's been used for generations and generations. And it's all kind of connected. I heard one scholar say that if we imagine the Gospels, it's almost helpful to imagine them as a Wikipedia page where certain phrases are hyperlinked. And when you click them, you get that full article. And he says that as we read the Gospels, if you have a reference Bible, one of the ones that has a little column down the middle, you can actually see where those hyperlinks go, how they're all interconnected and and referring to one another. And in the Gospels, it is very essential for them to connect their story to the bigger story that we've been reading throughout the Bible up until that point. So with those things in mind, we are going to ask, what is the most boring passage in the New Testament? And here's what's crazy. It's actually the very first one. That if you open up Matthew and you turn to the first chapter, the very first thing you are greeted with is a genealogy. A very long genealogy. How many of you just skip over it? How many of you heretics just skip right by it? You don't even look at, no, we, we all do that. We get to those genealogies in the Bible and we know, I guess they're important to somebody and we just, we move on because genealogies are, are boring sometimes. See, I saw a news story a couple of weeks ago uh, about Tom Hanks. And Tom Hanks just starred as Mr. Rogers in, in the movie where he, he plays him. And he was doing an interview, and the person interviewing came up and said, Hey, did you know that you are actually a distant cousin to Mr. Rogers? And he kind of lit up. He was excited in that moment. He learned that his family tree, they actually connected those two individuals. So in that moment, that genealogy became exciting. You know, it's like I could stand up here and I could show you guys my family tree. And I could do like an entire presentation on it. Some of you are thinking, oh God, please don't. Because genealogies can be boring. But sometimes they're not. See, my brother-in-law, he he did this thing where he actually uh, uploaded his information to one of the ancestry websites. Has anyone ever done this before? And so he did, and in the process of doing that, and it compiling all the connections, putting the genealogy together there, it was discovered that a donation he had made earlier in life had led to a son that he didn't know about living in the area. And through that website, the mother actually reached out And they connected, and he now sits at the table at Thanksgiving when we get together as a family. We we actually have a new connection there. It was one of those moments where a genealogy, this ancestry website, this big family tree could come across really boring, but out of it came a new relationship because we were personally invested in it. And so what I want to do as we look at this one this morning is to see how we might personally be invested in it. Does that sound good? I don't know why I asked that because if it doesn't, I have nothing else. I don't, this is not like a choose your own adventure sermon. So now we're going to take a look at what Matthew wrote. I'm not going to read it all, but we're going to take a look at the fact that Matthew is a nerd. Any nerds in the room? My hand is up. It's okay. God created you. It's fine. It's all good. Matthew is a nerd. And so when he goes out to do this genealogy, he's not just listing the facts. He's actually doing something extremely intentional here because he divides it up into three sections. And in each of those sections, there's 14 generations listed. And you might be wondering why those numbers? When Hebrews, numbers has a a lot of symbolic meaning to it. And if you take a look at the name of David in Hebrew, you see that there are three letters. Three is often a number used in the Bible to refer to spirituality or God. 
You've got the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. You've got three. There's three letters in David's name. And if you add up the Hebrew value of those letters, do you know what number you get? 14. You get 14. And so it's like three different times he's wanting you to know David, David, David. This whole thing connects back to David. Now, 14 is two sevens, and seven in Scripture is often used to refer to creation and completion. And throughout this entire thing, we see a pattern of creation and completion over and over. And then starting with Jesus, you have the seventh seven, which is the beginning of the early church. I know some of you are like, I did not know this much math was going to be involved. But Matthew is a nerd. He knows what he's doing here, and he's extremely intentional about it. In fact, he leaves people out in order for those numbers to work out. And he knows this. If you went back to the Old Testament and you turned to the book of Chronicles and you looked at the genealogies listed there, you would see that David has skipped over people for these numbers to work out. At first you might think, well, that's a scandal. How dare you do that? But before you judge, I know every one of you in this room, if I met you out there in the lobby and I said, tell me about your family there's somebody you're leaving out. You know what I'm talking about. There's the uncle that we don't share with strangers. Do you know what I mean? Like you're not going to share certain people in your family tree just right off the bat. So we can't judge too much. And also in this time of writing, they did that on purpose. In fact, the Bible Project says it this way. Ancient genealogies were ways of making theological claims and Matthew's readers would have understood exactly what he was doing and why. So let's take a look at those three sections. The first one goes from Abraham in the very beginning where God makes this promise to him and it ends with David, the greatest king in Israel's history. This first section ends with Israel at its highest point. Then section two goes from David to the exile. This moment where the people are led out of their own land and forced to live somewhere else apart from the promise that God had given them. It ends at lo Israel's lowest point. And then the third section goes from the exile to Jesus. Israel's new highest point. I love that. It's like the gospel kind of summed up in those three sections. You've got this highest point where everything is good, but then sin enters the picture and everything falls apart and they end up in the exile, but then Christ comes to redeem them and make them well. Is anybody else geeking out? Is that not awesome? Just me? Cool. It's fine. It's fine. I got really excited when I was preparing this sermon. I love what Matthew is doing there. And it gets even a little deeper than that. Because see, the prophets that we read about in the Old Testament, when the people returned from exile, they often said that they had returned physically, but not spiritually. That even though they were back home, they still needed a savior. And that's why we have the third section. And I like that because I've often found that there are times in my life where it appears on the outside that I'm in the right place, that I'm moving in the right direction, that I am where I am supposed to be. But in the inside, I'm not there. I'm not right with God. I'm still struggling. Anybody else ever felt that way before? That everything should be good, but it's not. And it's in those moments that I'm reminded that I still need a Savior. What are some of the other things that Matthew's doing here? One, he goes all the way back to Abraham because God started this whole thing with a promise to Abraham where he said, and through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. 
all because you have obeyed me. I love that. God starts this genealogy by saying that through you, the world will be blessed. And then it ends with the Savior of the world entering the picture. But Matthew does even more than that. In this genealogy, he includes four different women. Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba are all included here. And that's a, that's a pretty crazy thing. This is supposed to be a genealogy of fathers. And we find four mothers in the story. To understand just how crazy this would have been to the original reader, in Judaism, in first century Judaism, it was common for Jewish men to pray in the morning and to thank God that they were not created as a woman, a slave, or a Gentile. Like if you were trying to impress people, this is not something that you include in your genealogy. In fact, it actually lends credence to the fact that we believe the story of Jesus is true because if the early church was just trying to make up this story of the Savior, why in the world would you include these individuals in the family tree? Because see, these four women have some things in common. They were either non-Israelites or a part of non-Israelite families. They were all made famous for sexual sins, promiscuity. And in fact, they're often associated with breaking the covenant that God had with Israel. But they also have this in common. They were all bold. And they all, at some point, stood up and helped get the family tree back on the right path. As one scholar said when I was researching this, there is a motif that we see playing out over and over where these non-Israelite women step up and correct the issues of stupid Israelite men. Did I hear an amen? Was that, was that somebody? And I think that is awesome because what Matthew is doing here is he is showing us that everybody can be included in this thing that God is doing. Every single person, even if it's a non-Israelite woman in that time who's famous for her sin or wrongdoing, God can still use that individual to get things back on track and bring about the kingdom of God. And I think Matthew includes that in there to emphasize the point that God can use you. That if those four women can be listed in the first chapter of the New Testament that's going to introduce us to our Savior, that's going to connect him to the greatest king in Israel's history, I don't think you have any ability to come up and say, I don't think God can use me because of whatever. This is showing us that God can use each and every one of us. This is a little side tangent, but I also think it's Matthew showing us that God uses women over and over and over again. And if you ever find yourself a part of a church that downplays the role of women and what God has to do through their lives, I would suggest maybe looking for another church because we're missing out on what God is doing because God's been doing it throughout history. Amen? Amen. And so Jesus is a part of David's family tree. And Matthew is showing us that Jesus being a part of David's family, it mattered. To that original audience, hearing that this new savior is linked back to the greatest king in Israel's history, that would have meant a lot to them. But today as we read it, I think that us being a part of God's family matters. In fact, Paul says it this way in Ephesians. He said, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. That is what he wanted to do 
and it gave him great pleasure that we are a part of this genealogy. In fact, the most boring passage in the New Testament, it leads to you. I don't know about you, but I think that is, that is awesome that we are a part of God's story. And, and I know that there are times in life where things can feel dark, difficult. Maybe you find yourself wondering, what am I here for? What is my purpose on earth? I know sometimes that's worse around the holidays because we're reminded sometimes of the things that we don't have or the things that are missing from our lives. But it's in those moments that I think it's essential for us to remember that we are a part of God's story. That we're a part of God's family. That if we uploaded our information onto an ancestry website, and that website had the ability to keep going back and back and back, it would lead us to Jesus. It would lead us to David. It would lead us to Abraham and God's original promise that he was going to use us to bless the world. And I hope you find encouragement in that. I hope as the band comes up to close us out today, as we do a, a couple more songs here, that as we worship, we take just a few minutes to reflect on the fact that we are a part of God's story, that we're a part of God's family, that as Jesus was a son of David, we are sons and daughters of David because of Jesus. And I hope in that you find a lot of value that you find a lot of worth and that you find yourself going out and, and saying, you know what, if God can use everybody that's listed in that genealogy, he can, use, he can use me. If God can use the four gospel writers to tell different stories to different audiences, then God can use my story. My story matters. So dear God, that is my prayer for us this morning. That as we take a look at this passage in scripture that many of us skip over, that we look at and we say, well, that's just boring. It's a list of names. But in that, we can see the gospel play out. We can see a story that had its good moments, its bad moments, and then its redemption in Christ. We can see that in our own lives. And that as we see where that genealogy ended up, we can find ourselves in your story. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.